Siamo qua per uno dei primissimi film della, della sezione Orizzonti di un regista che è già stato a Venezia qualche anno fa, è un grande amico del festival, un grande regista americano, Ross McElway. Il, il film è sentito la Photographic Memory e insieme a Ross sono oggi i nostri ospiti e la produttrice del film um, è Maria Hardness. La montatrice Sabrina Zanella Faresi e il, uh, uno dei protagonisti del film è il figlio di Ross, Adrian McAway. Um, the, um, uh, the relationship between uh, time, uh, past and present. The, uh, the relationship between um, uh, digital and, and analog, the, the digital images and uh, ma you know, uh, material images. Um, the passing of time, it's, it's, it's about, this, this is what this film is about. Uh, I want to ask Ross and also um, uh, Sabrina, how did they wave this very complex tapestry, which is very much part, uh, an evolution in, in uh, what Ross filmmaking has been about? Well, there were, um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. There were uh, many false starts, I would say. <laughs> it took a long time to figure out. Um, and I had constructed a version which had very little material of Adrian. And um, there was a way in which it worked quite well. It really concentrated on my trip to France. Should I be speaking more slowly so it can be translated? No, it's, it's simultaneous. Simultaneous, okay. Um, and, uh, but I think, The film lacked complexity like that, so we kept reworking it and reworking it, and uh, then kind of added more material of Adrian, and then also more material of my father, and I think that gave it a generational um, dimension that it didn't have beforehand. Uh, and that was a great improvement. Once we'd sort of committed to that, I think we made pretty rapid progress, but it was remarkable how long it took to kind of figure that out. Um, But I don't know, Sabrina, do you have more to add? To that? Well, the material of the grown-up Adrian, we really were working with things that we were pulling out of, you know, things that he had shot, kind of not knowing what, if they would ever be anything. They were little things, and we realized as we started to pull out that material how, how much they really could show what it's like to be an adolescent who is Adrian in those moments, and it kind of made the film much fuller and kind of the film took on a really kind of wonderful complexity. I would say, you know, also that what's really so daunting about um, editing these kinds of documentaries, because they're so personal, they have so many layers, is you not only have to think about the thematic notion of the film, its various text and subtext and layers, but you just also have to be thinking about how it moves as a cinematic entity and Um, that it needs pacing and it needs uh, different scenes at different points in order to kind of keep a kinetic energy to it. And you know, there are times where I just don't know uh, <laughs> what we've done tonight. You know, today, quite frankly, watching it, it seemed a bit slow, but I couldn't tell whether it was just me being jet lagged and very, very tired. Or, um, and I think I have to see, you know, it's like if for me also, I have to see the film three or four times before I really see it. And it's just such a different experience because for all of those months we were watching it on something this large. Now and then we would have test screenings on slightly bigger, but this is a totally different experience. So it's like a film somebody else made. I didn't make it. It just happened without me in a way. Um, I'll get more and more familiar with it as time goes along. Uh, a lot of your work, Ross, has been about uh, memory and, 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 the, the, and the going back into time. Uh, but this one is by far, and we were discussing it before, your more Proustian films. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, maybe it's more like this than any film I've ever made because I'm now older than I've ever been before. And I think it's easier to kind of look back and think about the past when you have more past to look back on. Um, but yeah, I thought of, you know a lot about, I mean, Marie and I talked about um, You know, uh, Proust in particular because uh, when I, I was much younger I read um, uh, Swan's Way and I, I didn't read actually all seven volumes but I certainly read two of the volumes in addition to Swan's Way and it stayed with me, you know, it's a classic P. 
piece of world literature. It's not as if um, I discovered something that nobody knew about it. But it had an effect on me the way it's had on many writers, many filmmakers, and it was always in the back of my mind. I wasn't really trying to evoke Proust per se, but I think he was a kind of, along with a lot of other um, uh, mentors, he was a, a sort of psychological mentor for me. Wouldn't you say that's sort of accurate? Um, yeah. I think, yes, I, I agree. Yeah. I should actually say that um, Marie and I were, we, we began this film as a, not a film, but a kind of essay that I was writing based upon my experiences in France. We thought, didn't know what it would be. It would either become a kind of nonfiction essay that could be amusing or maybe it would evolve into a work of fiction. We just didn't know. But this was, you know, two years ago, maybe even longer. And it slowly kept evolving, and Marie kept saying, yeah, you should think about making a film. And I was saying, no, no, nobody cares. It's not going to be that interesting. So um, I feel I owe a huge debt to Marie for pushing me in that direction, and, you know, among all the other things that you did to kind of help along. Well, maybe one thing that was very different uh, in this work for you uh, is that you didn't work with um, archive footage. Yep. A lot of the archive were only photos uh, from that time and memory, memories of that time. So we first worked on mapping those memories and trying to find what Ross was remembering and what big roads of memories he could have and what little roads that would be dead ends m leading nowhere. Um, and, and some memories like Maurice, for example, became some kind of legend in his mind, which is really interesting because when he met Hélène, the legend was kind of different. So <laughs> was not the same man, he was not at all. So we tried, we explored these uh, roads. That was our first work, but not with footage. And this was very different, I think. More li literary, more like liter literature, right? Did that answer your question? Yes. Oh, okay. Marie? Uh, Good evening. Thank you, Ross, once again. Thank you, everybody. What a great film. Um, as usual in your cinema, uh, the narration, your voice, your text is crucial, very important. It's also a guide taking the viewer by the hand and taking him into the, on the path of memory and rediscovery. So I would like to know this time, specifically since your editor is with you, uh, did you change anything in the way you usually compose your text, use the text, uh, write the text? Uh, was it a different process uh, compared with your other works? Uh, and, well, can you comment on that? Thank you. Well, I would say, you know, one major difference is that um, I had a journal to work from, which became an artifact, a prop in the film, and I guess that was different for me because I'd always just created fresh writing from my imagination and from my memory. So in that way, it was quite different. But I think in most ways, it was the same. I kept trying version after version after version. I wrote and rewrote and rewrote dozens and dozens of times. It doesn't come easily for me, the writing of the narration. Um, and then you have to hear it and watch it with the images, and then it becomes something else altogether. So it took a long time. But I think I basically used the same approach that I've used in the past overall, with the exception of citing from a journal in a way, this, well, this film is also a conversation with Adrian, with your son Adrian, and it's a conversation about uh, your, your uh, relationship, but it's a conversation about cinema because uh, Adrian's images are also in the film. Can you both talk about how the process went uh, and uh, what it meant to uh, the conversation you had before? Um, when you speak of conversation before, are you regarding to the process of yeah. making the film, obviously, yeah. yeah. I think it was, at least in my eyes, not a uh, given that this would have ever become any type of uh, tangible cinema, I could say. And it was the, the pieces of the archival footage he has for me uh, a couple of years ago, mostly nothing too, nothing too much further than that, than the younger pieces of myself. Um, we, you know, we came to an agreement with, after, after a screening, you know, it was pretty much a surprise of the first draft, basically, for me, but uh, we, we came to an agreement that there's some, just like him exposing himself in certain ways about his past, 
you know, what he, what he had done with, uh, you know, with Maud and in his entire journey back to find this woman. It's kind of a uh, pretty very personal thing, and obviously so is the information with me and the, the footage and the images that you see. So I think that uh, he, tried, he tried to balance it well and somewhat, again, create this overall theme of what you see in the film is the, the kind of a fractured father relationship. And of course, we're in good we are in pretty good terms, and he's a good, he's a good father, and I, I think I'm a decent son, but um, yeah, it, overall, uh, I, I think it's a matter of picking and choosing the right, the, the right, uh, I guess, once again, images that uh, reflected what he was trying to accomplish as a, for this movie. And I should say that Adrian uh, provided us with uh, all the ski footage that he shot himself or his friend shot of him skiing. And um, before we had that in, uh, the film was lacking something and I didn't quite know what it was, but the minute that, that dynamic um, uh, uh, velocity that f the footage with velocity was used it seemed to make a huge difference in the film because the film pops up at that moment and sort of takes us into a different kind of world than the world inhabited by the father and that was a very conscious choice on mine but I couldn't have done it actually if you hadn't somehow known how to get that footage which I could never do you know skiing backwards and filming at the same time I still don't know how you do it well but it's um it was it was essential <laughs> I think to giving the film a kind of energy boost at certain points so one last thing about that is, uh, in general, I'd say a lot of people ask, were you uncomfortable seeing a lot of these images on the screen and projected and put into public uh, light? And the answer is yes. A lot of it is <laughs> definitely hard to see in terms of growing up even in the past couple of years and also compared to as uh, you know a younger child. But uh, I, think, I think once again, there's... It, each image and each scene with me, I guess, somewhat, even if it's pretty brutal, <laughs> it, does significant, it does help, uh, once again, bring back the entire you know, theme of the film and help strengthen it. Plus, now you get to go to film festivals. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Always one of us. And I'm also very tired. <laughs> uh, Anzitutto, complimenti perché mi sembra che il film sia davvero bellissimo, è molto coinvolgente e è coinvolgente anche grazie al fatto che è una meravigliosa festa delle immagini. Le immagini di questo film sono tutte bellissime. Allora mi chiedo eh, quan, che, che tipo di lavoro è stato fatto dal punto di vista eh, della, della fotografia, con quali eh, telecamere è stato ripreso se c'è stato alla fine una, una sorta di equalizzazione delle immagini, perché sono tutte davvero, davvero splendide. E, e poi mi chiedo anche, ho, ho capito che il progetto risale a due anni fa, quanti, eh, quanti sono, diciamo, come, come si è sviluppato il film? Cioè è stato pensato via via, è un work in progress, come, come è stato mh, messo in piedi e che cosa succede in fase di montaggio rispetto alla, alle riprese che sono state fatte? E, e ultima cosa, se è tutto improvvisato quello che vediamo nelle riprese o se ci sono, eh, come può sembrare per esempio, in, in alcuni casi nell'incontro eh, nell con, con la moglie di Maurice, che ci sia comunque una fase precedente, ecco un po' come, come si comporta sul set quando fa questo. Um, well, there, uh, there, there was many questions. I'll try to remember most of them and try to answer some of them. Um, but let me start at the very end. Uh, it is all um, spontaneous, I guess you say, when, when Ellen, the wife of Maurice, starts going through the photographs. That was really the first time she looked through the book. Uh, when she takes me to the studio to show me the studio, that's the first time we go to the photo lab, the studio. And I think uh, there are a lot of ways in which 
I owe a debt to Cinema Verite, though I don't think my films could be called Cinema Verite by any stretch of the imagination. But I think one of the things, one of the tenets of Cinema Verite that I uh, do respect and try to utilize whenever I can is that allegiance to spontaneity and where you don't rehearse people uh, doing things where you don't tell people the questions that you're going to ask them in advance or you don't plan out a shot or you don't do location research. Um, to me, it, you know, it makes the filmmaking more difficult in a way because you end up shooting things that you can't use so you have a higher ratio and also you end up not quite anticipating sometimes what's going to happen so you miss things but you do get a level of um, energy and uh, spontaneity that I think helps a lot with the filmmaking. When I filmed Adrian for instance we didn't rehearse anything we just sort of did it and I think... Um, to be honest I have no recollection of most of those yeah. shots. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's true and I think part of it is because I just walk into a room and I start filming uh, it's a little bit different when it's not your own house, not your own family. You have to set things up a little more carefully. Uh, at least tell them you're coming. Um, and with Ellen, for instance, all she knew was that I was Maurice's assistant 38 years earlier, and she was delighted that I was back in town. She didn't know, well, she knew I was making a film, but she had no idea what the film was be about. And I, myself, didn't really know what would happen with the film. You never know. So, um, we don't plan things out. There was no script. There was no shooting script. There was none of that at all. It was documentary in that sense. Now, of course, where it departs from being documentary is the writing of the voiceover. And then, of course, as you edit, you're making constant decisions that shape the um, footage in an uh, almost fictional way. I mean, you're making a documentary. It is like trying to make a fiction film because you want people to be interested and for it to tell a story the way that fiction films tell a story. But there is that difference and you're using moments from, from so-called real life or your real life or the life that you filmed around you. So in that way it was different than a fiction film. Um, you also asked about um, the images themselves. I'm glad you asked that, um, that question because I do try to give a lot of care to how a film is shot and um, <coughs> how it's composed and how the lighting is. And I'm um, using, uh, you asked what cameras I was using. This was my first use of uh, a Sony EX3, which is a new, uh, well, it's not so new anymore, but uh, when I got it uh, two years ago, it was brand new. It was a new digital um, video camera uh, for the film. Yes, uh, before this I shot super 16 millimeter um, film before. And the footage that you see embedded in this film is 16 millimeter, super 16, the footage of Adrian that I shot when I was quite young, and of Sarah uh, at the beach. Um, that's all super 16 millimeter. Uh, so there's a textual, text, a, a difference of texture to the footage. Um, and even VX1000. Yes, and also it is right, there were other cameras that I used as well. Uh, VX1000, um, which is a Sony uh, standard definition video footage, a uh, video camera. And before that even, uh, the, the shot where Adrian asked me what the microphone's going to do and whether that scene will be in a film, I shot that with Hi8, obviously, uh, almost uh, 20 years ago. Hi8 was another video medium. So in a way, in this film is a kind of condensed history of the recent two decades of image making, starting from 16 millimeter, Hi8, standard def video, and. HD, and it's nice that you noticed that. Yeah. And of course, the other thing that um, I'm playing with is the notion of uh, what does it mean to create an image and the difference between still photography and, um, and cinema, moving pictures. And I think uh, you know, that relationship is fairly obvious in the film because a lot of my time is spent meditating on what it means to take an image and how images change over time, even though they don't change. That whole scene with the church and talking about how the meaning of a photograph can change over time, even though clearly, obviously, it's the same photograph, nothing changes about it. I thought that was something that I was also quite interested in, in exploring in the film. So, I, I don't know how many of the questions I answered, but, so. 
I, I remember meeting you in Pesaro many, many years ago oh, yes. when you presented 6 o'clock news yes. uh, together with Adrian, who was then at about six year old, I think, <laughs> and very happy to be in the film, yes. uh, on stage at least. Yes. <laughs> and uh, we had dinner afterwards. Yes. When, um, and it is interesting for me how you, uh, the decision you made for the editing now, because uh, Adrian is still, and again, like in other, other films, but you decided to keep, for instance, this encounter with Maud when she takes the decision to stop, uh, to so make you stopping uh, shooting. And so there's a kind of negotiation between the two of us um, that you would uh, continue your talk without filming. And uh, of course, there's a lot of um, uh, reflection uh, by your voiceover, as usual, about the relationship and the filming and the editing. But there is not um, a similar um, dialogue with Adrian McElwee uh, that could be compared to the to the negotiations that you have with Maud. So, um, um, why this decision uh, to leave it somehow uh, in the film and to say yes, there is some footage uh, that Adrian contributed, but uh, it's up to the spectator to. Imagine. To imagine the relation or the, the negotiations, the daily negotiations about, about filming and about the editing. Yes. Well, that's a very interesting question. And it is true that I explain um, the situation with my filming mod and why I stopped filming in a way that I never do with Adrian. But I told Adrian if he didn't let me use the footage, I wouldn't give him his allowance. So <laughs> that's uh, funny. That's, <laughs> I decided that. Um, I don't know, Adrian, do you feel like yeah, on that? Uh, once again, I think to be honest here, I, I think he, being my father, he kind of waived that right of consent, <laughs> legal right of consent, and uh, went ahead and, uh, you know, uh, show, it showed me at least a, a first first draft of the film that I was like, okay, uh, you know, this is new to me, and uh, it, was, it was definitely a surprise at first, and if it was not my father, I, I probably would, uh, I'm not saying press charges, but I would definitely oh, come on. <laughs> I'm making a joke but no I, I would definitely it would be a little bit different if it was not uh, had that level of intimacy not that he didn't have that with Ma but it's, it's so long ago that it's different than with your own son of course but I think it's, it's worth saying that if you had really objected to any of the footage course, you would have taken it out of course no and he, he has that, obviously that integrity had I said I really don't feel comfortable with this uh, of course it would not be in the film and I know there was even some pushing for more uh, footage, not to get into detail, but and he rejected to that just due to the, uh, the, you know, on the behalf of my my sake, I, I guess. But uh, otherwise, you know, it is what it is, and I'm, there's I have no problem with that. And I guess it's the un, unspoken kind of dialogue that you don't hear in the film. Can I address this a little bit of that? I think part of the issue is that um, this is from the editing standpoint that Ross and, Ross's relationship to Adrian had to be negotiated. And once that had been negotiated, after the answering Mr. Dean message, and after he kind of says, OK, I need to let you find your own way, that the film, at least for that end piece that has to do with Maude, now can actually be for Ross. This is Ross's journey now, the completion of his journey. So I think we made very conscious decisions as to how we were going to negotiate the relationship between Adrian and Ross, and then where Ross could go on his own to complete his own act of memory in relation to Maud, and those two Mods that he experiences now. Il nostro microfono? Ah, grazie. Good evening, I'm Tony Fontana for Radio Cafoscari. Radio Cafoscari. Um, after this, this movie, uh, I think uh, uh, you know better your, your, your son. Uh, but um, um, what do you think now about uh, young people? And um, if you have uh, some advice uh, for, for them? Do I have some advice for young people? <laughs> um, um, well, I would feel you know, a little presumptuous offering advice to an entire generation. I mean, um, and yet, you know, I do have opinions about young people. And I think uh, you know, the thing that I tell Adrian sometimes is that 
I worry that he spends too much time on the internet with his iPhone and with his various other devices and is um, less aware of what's happening around him, even as people come into a room or as he's missing part of the world that's going by him. And I think the trick is, and I say this in the film, I don't know how I would have handled all of these tools if they'd been available. And I really mean that. I think it's something previous generations have never had to deal with. Uh, because image making and communication and the internet and social media is just so overwhelming. In all the ways that we've thought about, this is nothing new. But when you have a kid who's facing this and is to some degree, um, um, you know, I'll say it, I think frankly, both you and Mariah are a little bit addicted to it, that it's, it's truly something you worry about as a parent. So, you no, know, it's advice that won't be heeded, it won't be listened to, but my advice is just, you know, turn it off now and then and look around. You know, the world's a pretty interesting place. And yet, you know, I also feel a little ironic saying that because obviously, I mean, there are times when I'm not filming, of course, but, you know, in my film, I always have a camera and I'm always shooting, obviously, or I wouldn't have any images. So I'm criticizing him, and yet I'm doing the same thing in a more primitive way with the, with the camera. So who am I to give anybody advice about simply absorbing the world for what it is? It just makes me, um, it uh, reveals me as being kind of hypocritical. So I retract all of that advice and keep it to myself. <laughs> Mi dicono, I'm afraid I, mi dicono che devo, che devo smettere e che siamo fuori tempo massimo. One last question. Okay. <laughs> Which one? I was just interested in knowing, uh, you, you made a strong reference to phenomenology in your film. Yeah. Uh, was it uh, um, your first, uh, your point of departure, or was it influenced by the way you were filming? Uh, for example, uh, the, uh, the way you used the, the point of view. Um, was it something that suggested you to uh, refer to phenomenology, or was it uh, uh, the opposite? Um, I'm afraid I don't quite understand the question. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, well. Uh, we can speak about that later if you want, but I mean um, the the use of the camera from the point of view of the of the actor. Yes. Um, it's something that remembers of phenomenology. Was it the main reason why you referred to phenomenology to Merleau-Ponty? To yes, I would say well. It, exp it influenced me when I was quite young because Maurice, my employer, the photographer loved Milo Ponti and would talk about him a lot and sort of introduced me to the whole idea of image making and phenomenology and this whole way of thinking that I had never really encountered before. So in that way, it was very influential on me at a fairly young age, but I am not a scholar and I never really studied uh, Milo Ponti or any of the um, similar philosophers with any kind of depth or complexity. So I used it more or less as a kind of prop or an artifact in the film that, and I actually thought very carefully about how I wanted to quote it, because if I just used Milo Ponti's name alone after that quote, and that quote, by the way, has to go at the end of the film. It's a mistake that it comes right away from the beginning. It's, it's, a, it's a long story, but that should not have been there. Uh, but if I had not quoted Milo Ponti as quoted by Maurice, uh, Maurice Milo Ponti as quoted by Maurice Landoir, I think then it would have come across as being kind of uh, pretentious and I would not have done it. But the fact that I can be quoting my mentor, quoting his mentor, gave it yet another kind of layer that I found uh, accessible or acceptable, I should say. So does that answer? Yes, exactly. It's a coincidence. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm very, very sorry, but we have to interrupt. Sono mi spiacentissima, mi continuano a dire che siamo fuori tempo massimo per un'altra per un'altra cosa. Vorrei ringraziare, I want to thank my guest and uh, okay. our guest. Thank you. Thank you. Grazie.
No, actually, I have.